what means to orient oneself in thinking by emmanuel kant october seventeen eighty six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org let us employ our conception ever so sublimely and thereby abstract ever so much from the sensitive faculty yet there still adheres to them typical representations whose proper destination it is to make them which are not derived from experience fit for the use of experience for how could we procure signification to our conceptions were it not built upon some one intuition or other which at last must always be an example from some one possible experience when we afterwards leave out from this concrete act of the understanding the mixture of the type first of the contingent perception by sense then even the pure sensitive intuition in general that pure conception of understanding whose compass is now extended and contains a rule of thinking in general remains in like manner is the universal logic itself brought to pass and many heuristic methods of thinking lie perhaps still concealed in the experience use of our understanding and of reason which methods if we understood to draw them carefully from that experience might enrich philosophy even in abstract cogitation with many useful maxims of this nature is the principle which the late mendelssohn expressly professed as far as i know but in his last writings the morning hours pages 165 to 166 and the letter to lessing's friends page 39 and 67 namely the maxim of necessity in the speculative use of reason to which with regard to the cognition of supersensible objects he trusted so much even to the evidence of demonstration to orient himself by a certain mean of guidance which he sometimes termed common sense morning hours sometimes sound reason and sometimes sound understanding to lessing's friends who had thought that this acknowledgment of the potency of the speculative use of reason would have been so pernicious in matters of theology which in fact was inevitable but even the common sound reason on account of the ambiguity in which he left the exercise of this faculty in contradistinction to speculation would be in danger of serving as a principle of fanaticism and of the total dethroning of reason and yet this happened in the dispute between mendelssohn and jacobi chiefly in the by no means insignificant conclusion of the author of the result the understanding of the latter as an argumentum ad hominem which one is entitled to use as a mere defence in order to profit by the adversary's weakness to his disadvantage footnote jacobi on the doctrine of spinoza in letters to moses mendelssohn breslau seventeen eighty five leipzig seventeen eighty six and a footnote on the other hand i shall show that in fact it is reason merely not a pretended secret sense of truth no transcendent intuition under the name of belief upon which tradition or revelation may without the consent of reason be grafted but as mendelssohn maintained steadfastly and with just zeal merely the proper pure human reason whereby he found necessary and recommended to orient oneself though the great pretension of the speculative use of it and chiefly its sole commanding authority by demonstration must be dropped and so far as it is speculative nothing further left it than the business of purifying the common conception of reason from contradictions and the defence against its own sophistical attacks on the maxims of sound reason 
the extended and more precisely determined conception of self-orienting may assist us to exhibit distinctly the maxims of sound reason in their elaborations for the cognition of supersensible objects to orient oneself in the proper sense of the expression is from a given point into four of which we divide the horizon to find the other points or the orient or east if i see the sun and know that it is at present twelve o'clock i know how to find all the cardinal points south west north and east but for this purpose i absolutely require the feeling of a difference in my own subject to wit the right and the left hand i name it a feeling because these two sides show no sensible difference externally in the intuition without this faculty in the describing of a circle i could not know without needing in it some one difference of the objects to distinguish the motion from the left to the right from that in the opposite direction and thereby to determine a priori a difference in the situation of objects nor whether i could put west to the right or to the left of the south point of the horizon and so complete the circle through north and west to south again i therefore orient myself geographically in all objective data in the heavens but by a subjective ground of distinction and if one day by a miracle all the constellations were altered in their direction so that what was formerly eastern became western though they preserved the same figure and the same situation towards one another no human eye would the next starlight evening remark the smallest alteration and even the astronomer if he attended to that merely which he sees and not at the same time to what he feels would unavoidably disorient himself but the faculty of distinguishing by the feeling of the right and of the left hand which is indeed bestowed by nature but become familiar by frequent exercise comes very naturally to his assistance and will when he fixes the pole star not only remark the alteration which has happened but that notwithstanding be able to orient himself i may now extend this geographical conception of the procedure of orienting oneself and understand by it to orient oneself in a given space in general therefore merely mathematically in the dark i orient myself in a room which i know when i can lay hold of but one single object whose place i remember but here it is evident that nothing assists me but the faculty of determining the situations according to a subjective ground of distinction for i do not at all see the objects whose place i must find and if any one for the sake of a joke should place on the left side of a room all the objects which were before on the right though in the same order among themselves i were the walls all alike would not know what to make of the room but i quickly orient myself by the mere feeling of a difference of the two sides the right and the left the same thing happens at night when i must walk and turn properly in dark streets which i know but in which i can distinguish no house finally i may extend this conception still more where it would then consist in the faculty of orienting oneself not merely in space that is mathematically but in thinking in general that is logically it may be easily divined according to analogy that this will be an affair of pure reason to direct its use if it setting out from known objects of experience is to extend itself beyond all bounds of experience and finds no object of intuition at all but merely space for it as it is then no longer able according to objective grounds of cognition but merely according to a subjective ground of distinction in the determination of its own faculty of judging to bring its judgment under a precise maxim footnote 
to orient oneself in thinking in general is then when the objective principles of reason are insufficient to determine oneself in the holding true according to the subjective principle of it and footnote this subjective mean which then remains is nothing but the feeling of the proper want of reason one may remain secure from all air when one does not undertake to judge where one knows not so much as is requisite to a determining judgment thus ignorance in itself is the cause of the limits but not of the errors in our cognition but where it is not so arbitrable whether one shall judge determinately or not on something where an actual want and even such a one as adheres to reason itself renders judgment necessary and yet want of knowledge in regard to the points requisite to the judgment limits us a maxim is necessary according to which we pass our judgment for reason will be satisfied when it is then as previously made out that here there can be no intuition of the object not even something homogeneal with it by which we could exhibit the object suitably to our extended conceptions and thus secure them their real possibility nothing farther is left for us to do than first to prove well the conception with which we have a mind to venture beyond all possible experience whether it be free from contradictions and then to bring the relation of the object at least to the objects of experience under pure conceptions of understanding whereby we do not at all render it sensible but yet conceive of something supersensible suitable at least to the experience use of our reason for without this precaution we could make no use whatever of such a conception but instead of thinking extravagate however by the mere conception there is nothing yet effectuated with regard to the existence of this object and to the actual connection of it with the world the complex of all objects of possible experience but the right of the want of reason as a subjective ground of presupposing and assuming something which it dares not pretend to know by objective grounds presents itself now and consequently to orient itself in thinking in the immense space of the supersensible that is filled for us with dark night merely by its own want many supersensible things may be conceived for objects of the senses do not fill up the whole field of all possibility where reason however feels no want to extend itself to them and still less to suppose their existence reason finds employment enough with the causes in the world which manifest themselves to the senses or at least are of the same sort as those which manifest themselves to them not to stand in need in their behalf of the influence of pure spiritual beings of nature whose supposition would rather be detrimental to its use for as we know nothing of the laws according to which such beings may act but of those namely the objects of the senses we know at least we may hope to discover still a great deal the use of reason would rather be injured by such a presupposition it is therefore by no means a want it is rather mere curiosity which tends to nothing but reveries to search after them or to play with such phantoms the conception of a first being as supreme intelligence and at the same time as the chief good is of a totally different nature for not only that our reason feels a want to lay as a foundation the conception of the unlimited to the conception of all that is limited therefore of all other things but this want extends to the presupposition of its existence without which it can give itself no satisfactory ground at all of the contingency of the existence of the things in the world but least of all of the conformity to end and order which is everywhere to be met with in a degree so admirable in the small because it is near us still more than in the great footnote 
as reason requires to the possibility of all things to presuppose reality as given and considers the difference of things by negations adhering to them but as limits it finds itself necessitated to lay down originally as a foundation one single possibility namely that of the unlimited being but to consider all others as derived as the thorough possibility of every one thing must absolutely be met with in the whole of all existence at least the principle of the thorough determination renders possible the distinction of the possible from the actual of our reason but in such a way so we find a subjective ground of necessity that is a want of our reason itself to bottom all possibility upon the existence of a most real supreme being thus arises the cartesian proof of the existence of god subjective grounds of presupposing something for the use of reason which at bottom always retains but a use of experience being holden objective ones consequently want for insight so is it circumstanced that this and so are circumstanced all the proofs of the worthy mendelssohn in his morning hours they yield nothing for the behoof of a demonstration but they are on that account by no means useless for not to mention the fine occasion which these extremely ingenious developments of the subjective conditions of the use of our reason give to the complete cognition of this our faculty for the behoof of which they are permanent example thus is the holding true from subjective grounds of the use of reason when objective ones are wanting to us and we are nevertheless necessitated to judge always of the greatest importance only we must not give out what is but extorted presupposition as free introspection in order not to lay ourselves open without necessity to the opponent with whom we have engaged in dogmatizing who may use our weakness to our disadvantage mendelssohn certainly did not think that dogmatizing with pure reason in the field of the supersensible is the direct way to philosophical fanaticism and that nothing but a critic of this faculty of reason can cure this evil radically indeed the discipline of the scholastic method that of wolf for example which he therefore recommended where all the conceptions must be determined and every step justified by principles may stop this mischief for a time but by no means withhold it entirely for with what right will one hinder reason which according to his own acknowledgment has succeeded so well in that field from going still further in the same and where is then the boundary where it must stop End of footnote. Without assuming an intelligent author, there cannot, without falling into mere absurdities, be assigned the smallest intelligible ground to those, and, though we cannot evince the impossibility of such a conformity to end without a first intelligent cause, for then we had had sufficient objective grounds of this assertion and not required to appeal to the subjective ones notwithstanding this want of insight a sufficient subjective ground of supposition of it remains namely that reason requires to presuppose something that is intelligible to it in order to explain by it this given phenomenon as everything else with which it can combine but a conception doth not supply this want but the want of reason may be considered as twofold first in its theoretical use and secondly in its practical the first want i have just mentioned but it is obvious that it is but conditional that is we must assume the existence of god if we would judge of the first cause of all that is contingent chiefly in the order of the ends actually placed in the world far more important is the want of reason in its practical use because it is unconditional 
and we are then necessitated to presuppose the existence of god not only if we would judge but because we must judge for the pure practical use of reason consists in the precept of the moral laws but they all lead to the idea of the chief good that is possible in the world so far as it is possible by liberty only morality on the other side to that which does not concern human liberty merely but nature namely the greatest felicity so far as it is distributed in proportion to the first reason now requires to suppose such a dependent chief good and for the behoof of it a supreme intelligence a chief independent good not indeed to deduce from him the commanding authority of the moral laws or the spring to their observance for they would have no moral value if their motive were derived from anything but from the law only which is of itself apodictically certain but only in order to give objective reality to the conception of the chief good that is to hinder it together with all morality from being held a mere ideal if that whose idea inseparably accompanies morality existed nowhere it was therefore not cognition but a felt want of reason by which mendelssohn oriented himself without his knowledge in speculative cogitation footnote reason feels not it prospects its deficiency and operates by the instinct of cognition the feeling of the want it is with this as with the moral feeling which occasions no moral law for this arises entirely from reason but it is occasioned or operated by moral laws therefore by reason as moved and yet free will requires determinate grounds and footnote and as this means of guidance is not an objective principle of reason a principle of introspections but a merely subjective one that is a maxim of the use allowed it by its limits only a consequent of the want and constitutes of itself only the whole determinative of our judgment on the existence of the supreme being of which it is but a casual use to orient oneself in the speculative essays on the same object so he no doubt failed in confiding so much in the faculty of his speculation to effectuate everything of itself only by the way of demonstration the necessity of the former mean could have place but when the insufficiency of the latter was fully acknowledged an acknowledgment to which his acuteness would at last have brought him if together with a longer life had been granted him the fancy of mind more peculiar to juvenile years to alter easily an old familiar cast of mind according to the alteration of the state of the sciences however the merit remains to him of maintaining that the last touchstone of the admissibleness of a judgment here as well as elsewhere is nowhere to be sought but in reason only whether it be guided in the choice of its position by insight or mere want and the maxim of its own profitableness he denominated reason in its latter use the common reason of man for this has always its own interest first in view but one must have wandered from the natural track to forget that and idly to explore conceptions in an objective view in order to enlarge one's knowledge merely whether it be necessary or not but as the expression decision of sound reason in the question on the carpet is still ambiguous and may be taken either as mendelssohn himself understood it to be a judgment from insight of reason or as the author of the result seems to take it a judgment from inspiration of reason it will be necessary to distinguish this source of judgment by another denomination and none is more apposite to it than that of a belief of reason 
every belief even the historical must be rational for the last test of truth is always reason but a belief of reason is that which is built upon no other data than what are comprised in pure reason belief is however a subjectively sufficient holding true but objectively with consciousness an insufficient one it is therefore opposed to knowing skiri on the other hand when something from objective though with consciousness insufficient grounds is holding true consequently opined merely this opining may nevertheless by a gradual completion in the same grounds finally become a knowing whereas when the grounds of holding true according to their species are not at all objectively valid the belief can never become a knowing by any use of reason the historical belief exempli gratia of the death of a great man of which several letters give notice may become a knowing when the magistrate of the place makes mention of it of his burial testament etc hence it is perfectly consistent that something historical is held true from testimony merely that is believed for instance that there is a city named rome and yet he who never was there may say i know and not merely i believe there exists a rome on the other hand the pure belief of reason can never be transformed into a knowing by all the natural data of reason and of experience because here the ground of holding true is subjective merely namely a necessary want of reason and as long as we are men will ever remain only to presuppose the existence of a supreme being but not to demonstrate this want of reason for its theoretical use satisfying itself would be nothing else than a pure hypothesis of reason that is an opinion that were sufficient to holding true from subjective grounds because another ground can never be expected to explain given effects and yet reason stands in need of a ground of explanation whereas the belief of reason which rests upon the want of its use in a practical view may be named a postulate of reason not as if it were an insight which satisfied every logical demand but because this holding true when in man all is but morally well disposed according to the degree is inferior to no knowing though according to the species it is totally distinct from it footnote to the firmness of belief belongs the consciousness of its immutability now i may be fully certain that nobody can refute the position there is a god for whence will he take this insight therefore the belief of reason is not of the same nature with the historical belief in which it is still possible that proofs to the contrary may be found and where it must always be in our power to alter our opinion if our knowledge of things should enlarge itself and footnote a pure belief of reason is therefore as a waymark or a compass by which the speculative thinker may orient himself in his excursions of reason in the field of supersensible objects but it can point out to man of common yet morally sound reason his way in a theoretical as well as a practical view fully suitable to the whole end of his destination and it is this belief of reason which must form the basis of every other belief nay every revelation the belief in god and even the conviction of his existence can be met with in reason only can arise but from it and can be first awakened in us neither by inspiration nor by an account given however great the authority may be should an immediate intuition happen to me of such a sort as nature as far as i know it cannot at all yield 
a conception of god must however serve as a rule to judge whether this phenomenon agree with all that which is requisite to characterize a divinity i by no means introspect how is it possible that any one phenomenon should even but according to the quality exhibit that which can be cogitated only but never intuited yet so much at least is clear that in order to judge whether that which appears to me which acts internally or externally on my feeling be god i must compare it with my idea of god and prove it accordingly not whether it be adequate to this but merely whether it be not inconsistent with it in the same manner if in all whereby he discovered himself immediately to me nothing repugnant to that conception were to be met with yet this phenomenon intuition immediate revelation or however such an exhibition may be named can never evince the existence of a being whose conception if it shall not be insecurely determined and thereby subjected to the mixture of every possible fancy requires infinity as to greatness for the distinction from all creatures but to which conception no experience or intuition whatever can be adequate consequently can never prove unambiguously the existence of such a being nobody can therefore be first convinced of the existence of the supreme being by any one intuition the belief of reason must precede and then perhaps certain phenomena or discoveries may give occasion to investigate whether we are entitled to hold a divinity what either speaks to us or presents itself to our view and according to the circumstances to confirm that belief if then the right to speak first belongs to reason in matters which concern supersensible objects as the existence of god and the world to come be impugned a wide gate is open for all sorts of fanaticism superstition nay even atheism and yet everything in the dispute between jacobi and mendelssohn seemed to aim at this overthrow i do not well know whether merely the insight of reason and of knowing by opinionative strength in speculation or even of the belief of reason and on the contrary aims at the establishment of another belief which one may form at pleasure one would almost conclude the latter but he sees displayed spinoza's conception of god as the only one harmonizing with all the principles of reason and yet rejectable footnote it is not to be comprehended how these men of letters could find aid to spinozism in the critique of pure reason the critique of pure reason entirely clips the wings of dogmatism with regard to the cognition of supersensible objects and spinozism is in this so dogmatical that it vies with the mathematician even in respect of the strictness of demonstration the critique of pure reason proves that the table of the pure conceptions of understanding must contain all the materials of pure thinking spinozism speaks of thoughts which think themselves even and also of an accident which at the same time exists of itself as subject a conception which is not at all to be found in the human understanding and is not possible to be framed by it the critique of pure reason shows that it by no means suffices for maintaining the possibility of a being conceived by oneself that there is nothing contradictory in its conception though it is then by all means allowed in case of necessity to suppose this possibility but spinozism pretends to prospect the impossibility of a being whose idea consists of only pure conceptions of understanding from which are separated all the conditions of the sensitive faculty and wherein a contradiction can never be met with and is not able to support this boundless pretension by anything for this very reason does spinozism lead directly to fanaticism 
whereas there is no sure means of extirpating all fanaticism but that determination of the bounds of the faculty of pure reason in like manner another man of letters finds in the critique of pure reason a scepticism though the very design of that work is to establish something certain and determinate a priori with regard to the compass of our cognition also a dialectic in the critical investigations which is however employed in resolving and destroying forever the unavoidable dialectic with which pure reason exercised everywhere dogmatically entangles and ensnares itself the new platonists who named themselves eclectics because they know how to find their own chimeras everywhere in older authors when they had previously imputed such to them proceeded directly in the same manner thus nothing new happens under the sun and footnote for though it is perfectly consonant to reason to grant that speculative reason is not able to prospect the possibility even of a being such as we must conceive god it cannot be consistent with any belief or with any holding true of an existence that reason can prospect the very impossibility of an object and yet cognize from other sources its actuality men of abilities and of enlarged sentiments i honor your talents and love your feeling for humanity but have ye well reflected on what ye are doing and on what may be the tendency of your attacks on reason no doubt ye are willing that the liberty of thinking shall be maintained unvexed for without this there were soon an end to your free soarings of genius let us see what must naturally be the consequence of this liberty of thought if such a procedure as ye are beginning should prevail the liberty of thinking is first opposed to the civil coaction it is said the liberty of speaking or of writing may indeed be taken from us by the chief power but the liberty of thinking by no means but how much and with what justness would we think if we did not think in a manner in a community with others to whom we communicate our thoughts and who communicate theirs to us therefore it may well be said that that external power which robs men of liberty of communicating their thoughts publicly deprives them likewise of the liberty of thinking the only jewel that notwithstanding all the civil burdens remains to us and by which only counsel can be procured against all the evils of this situation secondly the liberty of thinking is taken in the signification too that the coaction of conscience is opposed to it where without any external power citizens in matters of religion set themselves up as guardians of others and instead of arguments know by means of prescribed formulas of faith accompanied with anxious fear of the danger of a proper investigation to banish by an early impression on the minds every trial of reason thirdly liberty in thinking signifies also the subjection of reason to no other laws than those it gives itself and its opposite is the maxim of a lawless use of reason in order thereby as genius fancies to see farther than under the restriction by laws the consequence of which is naturally this that if reason will not be subjected to the law which it gives itself it must bend under the yoke of laws which another gives it for without some one law or other nothing at all not even the greatest nonsense can play its part long therefore the explained lawlessness in thinking an exemption from the limitations by reason is this that liberty of thinking is thereby lost at last and as it is not the fault of misfortune but of true presumptuousness in the proper sense of the word trifled away the course of things is pretty nearly this 
in the first place genius as it has run out the clue by which it formerly directed reason is very much pleased with its daring soar it soon bewitches others by decisions of authority and great expectations and seems now to have placed itself upon a throne which slow unwieldy reason graced so ill though it always continues to speak the language of reason the then adopted maxim of the invalidity of a chief legislative reason we denominate common fanaticism of men but the minions of bountiful nature illumines as however a confusion of tongues must soon happen even among these since every one as reason can only command with validity for everybody follows at present his own inspiration so there must arise at last from internal inspirations by testimonies of facts externally proved from traditions which were chosen in the beginning by oneself in process of time obtruded records in a word the total subjection of reason to facts that is superstition because this may be reduced to a legal form at least and thereby to a state of rest but as human reason still aspires to liberty its first use of a long disaccustomed liberty when it once breaks the fetters must degenerate into abuse and audacious confidence in the independence of its faculty on all limitation in a persuasion of the sole dominion of speculative reason which supposes nothing but what can be justified on objective grounds and dogmatical conviction but boldly denies everything else the maxim of the independence of reason on its own want renunciation of the belief of reason is named unbelief not a historical unbelief for one cannot at all conceive it as designed therefore not as capable of imputation because every one must believe just as much as a mathematical demonstration a fact that is sufficiently verified but an unbelief of reason a dangerous state of the human mind which first deprived the moral laws of all the power of springs on the heart and in process of time even divest them of every authority and gives occasion to the cast of mind which is termed free thinking that is the principle to acknowledge no duty whatever here now the magistrate interferes in order that civil affairs may not fall into the greatest disorder and as the promptest and yet most energetic mean is directly the best for him he totally annuls the liberty of thinking and subject it like other trades to the laws of the land and thus liberty in thinking when it is resolved to proceed independently on laws of reason ultimately destroys itself friends of the human species and of that which is the most sacred to it assume what appears to you the worthiest of belief after the most careful and most sincere trial whether it be facts or whether it be grounds of reason but do not dispute reason out of that which it makes the chief good on earth namely the prerogative of being the last test of truth footnote thinking for oneself is to seek the chief touchstone of truth in oneself id est in one's own reason and the maxim to think for oneself at all times is enlightening thereto belongs not just so much as those may imagine who take knowledge to be enlightening as it is rather a negative principle in the use of one's cognoscative faculty and he who is very rich in knowledge is often the least enlightened in the use of it to exercise one's own reason means nothing more than relatively to everything else which one is to suppose 
to question oneself whether it be feasible to constitute a universal principle of the use of one's reason the ground why one supposes something or also the rule that follows from that which one supposes every one may make this trial with himself and immediately on this proof he will see superstition and fanaticism disappear though he has by no means the knowledge to refute either of them from objective grounds for he uses the maxim of the self maintenance of reason merely to found enlightening in single subjects by education is therefore very easy one has nothing to do but to begin early to accustom young understandings to this reflection but to enlighten an age is very wearisome for there are many external hindrances which partly interdict and partly render more difficult that mode of education End of footnote else ye will be unworthy of this liberty or certainly lose it too and besides will bring this misfortune on the innocent part of mankind who had otherwise been well-minded enough to use their liberty legally and thereby conformably to the end of the public good end of what means to orient oneself in thinking by Immanuel Kant, October 1786.